My presentation or my talk is about making a cartridge for the Coco 2. Um, I have never, until just recently, I'd never owned a Coco or even seen a Coco. I had never done a cartridge project, and I thought, okay, well, what I'll do is I'll make a Coco project that is also a cartridge project, and then I can kind of kill two, two projects with one stone. I, uh, I'm a teacher. I work in, uh, at the Technology Center of DuPage in Addison, which is um, about 15 minutes from here. I teach at a vocational school, mostly high school juniors and seniors, uh, and I teach a class called CIS Game Design, which is kind of a, um, it's a game programming class with a heavy slant on computer science. Uh, and so not only is this my job, but I've also been doing this for a long time. I'm like a long-time hobbyist. This is a Sinclair user magazine picture from 1983, and the kid with the army jacket and all the hair is me. So I, lo I love that picture. I always have to stress the hair, too. And when people ask me, are you, are you sad that you don't have hair? I said, no, look, when I had hair, I didn't even know what to do with it. So <laughs> I've, just, I've just streamlined my life a little bit. Um, so that's where I work. And, you know, I sort of show all this stuff to the students. And... Uh, kind of try to get them interested in the, the retro stuff. Uh, so again, as I was saying, I've never done a Cocoa project or even seen a Cocoa until a few years ago at the Cocoa Fest. And I thought, oh, th th hey, this is that computer people used to say good things about. Because I'd heard about it, and people said good things about it, but I'd never actually um, never seen one. Uh, so it kind of got me intrigued. And then I went and I kind of looked it up uh, on Wikipedia to get some information on the machine. And the thing that really kind of hooked me into this machine was the processor. Because I don't know if you guys know the 6502, but you're limited to like three registers and there are only eight bits. And you're hitting the thing and you can only push the accumulator to the stack. And so any 6502 project, it just feels like you, you know, you're always kind of fighting with the processor. But the 6809, which is in the Coco, is like the 6502, but like the 16-bit version of it. It's kind of like, yes, it's the 6502 with all the really annoying limitations removed. So it has 16-bit uh, index registers. Um, so it's basically a three-register. You have two index registers. And then you have a 16-bit accumulator, which is really a register pair. So you can have either two 8-bit accumulators or one 16-bit accumulator, depending on what you're doing. Um, there are two stacks. I've never seen a processor like this before. It has like, not only the regular system stack, but there's a separate stack in there for um, whatever you want. And the game that I wanted to program was very heavy on recursion, which is kind of well suited to using a stack. So I was like, ah, perfect. Um, and the stacks are relocatable. They're not like stuck anywhere in memory. Um, there are some 16-bit features too. You can add 16-bit numbers in like one instruction as opposed to like five on the 6502. Uh, and there's actually an 8-bit multiply instruction. You can multiply the two 8-bit accumulators together to get a 16-bit problem. It's really nice when you kind of plot uh, positions on the screen. So the processor was really great. So, uh, oh yeah, and you're not stuck to that limit of, you can only push the accumulator to the stack. You can push the registers to the stack in any order you want. Uh, here's what it looks like as a picture. So you've got your two, your two stack registers, um, your two index registers, and then you've got your uh, accumulator, uh, which you can use as a register pair. Um, now, I get so excited about this processor, right? So every time I'm on I-90, you know, like you go by the medieval time Motorola building, like I'm in the car with my children. I'm like, look, children, the Motorola building, right? That's where they made the 6809 processor. Oh, yeah, and a giant medieval castle right next to it. Um, like, take your pick which one you find more, uh, you know, exciting. Like, I'm always like, oh, look, look, the Motorola building. And my kids are like, oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I was kind of interested in this machine. And then I went to the, the Coco Fest back in, I think it was May, just a few months ago. And my wife said, now, Evan, you know, when you go to these things, like, you come back with computers, and you kind of have a lot of computers already. So before you do this again, like, think like, long and hard about, like, do you really need this computer? I said, yes. I know you're right. You're right. So, so here's the computer I came home with. Um, <laughs> it's the, it was the Coco 2. It was very badly sun damaged. I, had to, I repainted it because it turns out Home Depot has, the right, has a can that exactly matches the color. Uh, you could see actually the bottom is like super, super brown because I didn't respray that part. Um, but there it is. It's, it's kind of equivalent to a Commodore 64. It's the Coco 2 64K um, and uh, RF video out. It would be nice if it had compositor or VGA or something, but it doesn't. Um, okay, so machine and I've got, you know, I'm kind of interested in this. So it's like the next thing to do is like figure out like is there a tool set available for doing this project that you want to do? Uh, and it turns out that there is, uh, I like to call this part of the show, like, why do I have to 
make three times, like make, install, make, make, make big. Because um, I had to build my stuff from Linux source code. Um, if you know Linux, you probably get that. Um, so the first thing you need to find is, that, is there some way to get the program that you're going to write from your PC into the Cocoa? And so this was actually what I went looking before, before I even went looking for the Coco. And I went to the Coco Fest a few months ago, and I saw this thing. It's the Coco SDC. Uh, it was a kit, and I soldered it together, and, um, it, and, it, and it works. So it's, it's a good way of using an SD card to move your program from the PC over to the Coco. So it's like, OK, if you've got that piece, then the rest of it is probably going to work out. Um, so what else do you need? Well, you're going to need an assembler. Um, there's a package out there called LW Tools. That's what I use for the assembler. There's also another utility in that package that you're going to need um, called Make Coco File. Uh, and I'll talk about that later. And then the development environment I used was Sigwin. Do you guys know what Sigwin is? OK, it's like the Linux shell. It's like a fake Linux shell running on your PC. Um, and for the emulator and the debugger, I actually used MAME. I didn't realize you could use MAME as a debugger. I use it for playing, up to now, I've used it for playing Pac Man and like Mario Brothers. Um, with my kids, but you can run MAME where you say MAME-debug and it brings up MAME with a debugger and you can set breakpoints and watch points and you can look in the memory and stuff. So it's actually really good. And then just for fun, I thought I'd throw the code up on GitHub. Uh, there's tons of documentation out there, like unlike other platforms like the Sinclair or something. I was like, I, I shouldn't have started with the Sinclair project. That was too hard. Uh, so there's some good books out there. I like the Rodney Zach ones. There's a website called the Cocopedia. There's a good one by Chris Lamont called Lamont.org. Like there's tons of documentation out there. So the documentation is not a problem. Uh, and then finally, it's like, okay, well, I've got all this stuff. It looks like the tools are there, the documentation is there, the hardware is there. Like, what game do I want to do? Um, so the game I picked was this game called Flood It. And I wonder if I can actually, can I play this thing? No, I don't know why it's not going to let me play it. Um, the goal of the game is to get this grid to be all one color. And you do that by bucket filling the top left corner. So if this is purple right here and you bucket fill this with purple, now your blob includes this purple block here. And then let's say you want to go grab the green, you bucket fill with green and you start grabbing, your blob gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you do bucket fills. And if you pick the right color combinations, you can get your board to be uh, all one color within a certain number of turns. Um, it's kind of a fun game. We do it in C Sharp in my class. It's popular, kids like it. So that's kind of one of my go-to games anytime I go to a new platform. Um, OK, so now that we've got the game, got all the stuff um, set up, the first step is to make just a regular file version of it. Like, forget about the cartridge part. Like, handle that complexity later. Just can I get a working program? So I call this part of the show, like, why won't my program start? Um, because I ran into some potholes. Um, when I did this, right? This project was kind of like finding the potholes by hitting them at 60 miles an hour in my car. Um, so why won't the program start, right? Let's look at that. Um, the first thing you have to do is build your file, right? So here's the assembler. There's the LW Tools assembler. Build your assembly file for the 6809 and turn it into that thing, into a bin file. Okay, so now you have an output file. That's good. Um, and now in order to get it over to the Coco, you have to attach it to, the disk, to a disk file. You can't just like, move a binary file over and run it. You can't move an individual program. You have to move a disk image. So if you actually go into the, the Coco and you plug in the Coco SDC run, and run that command, it'll create, this command would create a new disk image called systools.disk, right? So I created a disk called evan.disk. So now I have my binary file that's my program, and then I have a disk image. And then you use this command, the Coco, or sorry, write Coco file. That's in LW Tools too. That attaches your, your program, your game, to your disk image. And now you can take it and walk it over to, the PC, or to your Coco and run it. So that's... That was kind of the, the, the missing glue I had to figure out, the right Coco file part to attach the game to the disk image so I could move it over to the, the computer. Um, so this was the part that was a little bit tricky. So every file that you want to run, it has to have a header on it and a, a, a trailer on it called the preamble and the postamble that tell the operating system where to load the file when you run it and then also how big the file is. So it's, You've got this file, and you have to just put this information, this meta information, on it, so that when you try to, when you type load m and then the name of the program, like the little whatever ROM basic operating system can figure out like where to put the thing and how much space to give it. Um, so that was the hard part was was figuring this this little out. It, it wasn't obvious. 
So the LW assembler will actually put the preamble and the postamble on for you. You don't have to go like add it yourself, but you, you have to set up the directives to um, properly in order for that to happen. So in, in between, like around your code, you want to sandwich your code in between this, the word start and the, and the words end start. So what I had was, I just had start and end. It just like end start didn't seem to make any sense. And the assembler didn't complain about that. Like it was totally fine and running that, except that what it would do then was put the preamble on, but not the postamble. And that took me a long time to, to figure out. I had to go in with like a hex debugger or you know, a hex editor and open up the thing and like, like why isn't the postamble getting stuck on there? Um, so it's really important if you're doing this to get the start uh, before your code and then end start after your code. If you don't do that, you're not going to get the postamble and your program will load and then not run. And it's really baffling until you, you just realize that you're missing a directive. Um, and then, yay, magically, you can run your game. Here's the main debugger, there's your game, and then you can see here's your registers, there's the disassembly, uh, and then you can walk through your game, and now you can debug the regular disk file version of it, again, before you go turn it into a cartridge file. So that's, that's the key thing, just like put the, do the complexity in layers. Um, okay, so now that you have a working disk file or a working kind of binary file, how do you rewrite that thing to be a cartridge file or a CCC file? Um, or as I call this part of the show, why won't my cartridge start? Um, so similar, similar problems. Um, the cartridge does not have a preamble and a postamble. So when you build the code, you have to use this option, dash dash raw. So that, that says just dump out the file, but don't put the pre and postamble on it. Um, and that kind of makes sense if you think about it, because if you look at the memory map for the computer, the cartridge fits in this kind of 8K hole in the address space starting at hex C000. So all cartridges start at the same place, it's kind of assumed that they're all the same size. You just don't need that information on there that says how big the thing is and where does it go. The fact that it's on a cartridge implies where it goes in the memory. Um, so, so I did that. I just did the dash, dash raw thing plugged it in and it didn't start. I was like, oh. So what I did was I put a watch point on that address, the first byte of the cartridge address space, the C000, and just kind of, is anybody looking at this thing? Uh, and just to see if anybody was reading it or not. And it turns out like the, I don't know, they call it the OS or ROM basic or whatever, when you start up, it looks at the first two bytes on the cartridge to see if it's the letters DK. And I was not sure what that was. I found in the Dragon computer documentation that DK is, stands for disk, right? It's looking for a disk. If it finds those two bytes on the, on the, at the start of your cartridge, it jumps just past those two bytes and runs whatever it finds there. So all you have to do to make a cartridge file is just not put a header on it and then just stick the hex 44 4B on the front and now magically it will run. Um, okay, so the other thing is that was a little bit interesting is this branch. It doesn't do a jump subroutine into your code and run it. It does a branch. So you can't really return back out of your cartridge. And I, I had to plug in a bunch of cartridges to see if, like, when you play a cartridge, is there any expectation that you can quit and go back to basic? And it doesn't, like, there's not. It's like you just turn off the machine and you take out the cartridge. Um, so if you had code in there that said quit back to the operating system with a return, you have to remove it. Um, so but your, your, brand, your code gets branched into rather than jump, jump subroutined into. You can't return back. You don't return back out of your program ever. Um, okay, and I thought I was so happy. I was so proud of myself. I'm like, yes, I now have this like, cartridge image I can load, and then I'd load it, and it would lock up. I was like, ugh. So we get to the point of the show where I say, no, you can't leave variables in ROM, right? So even my son looking at these ROM chips, he's like, hey, Dad, isn't that the sort of stuff that you can't put, like, that you can't use as variables? I'm like, yes, thank you, son. Um, like, it's, again, it's, you know, you find the potholes by driving over them. Um, so this is a problem that's specific to the Coco 2. So apparently on the Coco 3, when you plug in a cartridge, that entire cartridge image is loaded into RAM, and you don't have to worry about this. On the Coco 2, it doesn't do that. So what you have to do is, carve out a space uh, in RAM and then move your variables into there, which means you kind of have to split up your program into two chunks. Uh, and the way you do that is, is with the origin directive. So the origin says like where you're, when you make your offsets, when the assembler's making its offsets, like where to start the code. And so you have your 
origin one, you know, at the beginning of the cartridge space, then your, your code, and then you have another origin statement for your variables, and then you put your variables after that. And then you have to have a subroutine that copies the, vari the, the initial values of the variable from the ROM uh, chip into the RAM. So you, you have to split up your program into two segments and then initialize the second segment with, with your, the initial values for your variables. So that was, okay. I just didn't even know if that would work. I thought, like, was the assembler going to yell at me if I try to do two origin statements? Like, it turns out it works. Um, and then, yay, it works. And this is the same slide I had in the last, you know, a couple slides back. This is a very low-budget presentation. Um, so, so there's, yeah, there's the main debugger running the cartridge file. And it, it works now. OK, great. So now we've got a working cartridge file. How do you actually get the thing onto a physical cartridge? And there were some problems with this, too. But I had a lot of help. Right? This is going to be a very awkward presentation because a lot of the people that helped me on this project are going to be in the room, right? So um, I'm going to be talking about something and the handle will go, yeah, yeah, I did that. Um, that was me. Um, so <laughs> right, now we get to the part of the show, why won't the EEPROMs program, right? Why don't the EEPROMs work? Uh, I had a lot of difficulty actually making the physical cartridge. I, what I thought was going to be the easiest part turned out to be one of the most frustrating parts. And I still not why it was one of the most frustrating parts. Okay. So, if you are going to make a cartridge, you need something like this that will actually take that CCC file that you built and dump it into a ROM chip, like you know, what's in this, this bag right here. Um, you know, things that look like a dead caterpillar. So I had no idea what these things cost, if it was cost effective to do something like this. It turns out you can get this on eBay for, you know, on Amazon for about $45, like less than $50. If you pay for the, the deluxe version, they'll give you all these uh, extra add-ons for programming chips that have different packages, like the, the pin grid array, the ones that have the little pins that go around the sides. Uh, so depending on like how, how, you know, what variety of chips you want to program, you could get the deluxe one. I just got the bare bones ones for, for 40 bucks or 45 bucks. And I was kind of reluctant to buy it because one of the reviews said, oh, this thing is a piece of junk. But then I can't figure out how to use it. But then the next post was, no, it's easy. There's a tutorial on EEV blog. Do you guys watch this EEV blog guy? Oh my god, he's awesome. You should all go like, watch EEV blog right now. Um, he, it's like the, if the crocodile hunter took apart old computers. Like, he's, this, he's, like, he's so ridiculously over-enthusiastic about what he does. And he's constantly throwing in all this Australian slang that I do not understand. And anytime he finds a, finds a triple five timer chip, he goes absolutely ballistically like, excited with glee. Uh, so I was like, yes, I love EEV blog. So I watched the tutorial, and he like, showed how to program chips. And I was like, OK, well, if Dave Jones says it's OK, um, then, then I'll, I'll go with it. Um, but I'm going to come back to the tutorial later, because there's an interesting thing in there that when I went back to watch it the second time that I noticed. Um, you also need an EEPROM eraser, which is very cheap. They're like 15 bucks. Um, I call this the tanning salon for cockroaches or dead caterpillars, right? So you put the EEPROMs in this thing, you crank it up, and then the electro, or sorry, the ultraviolet light erases them. So it's like a little tanning salon. Um, and you just put the chips in there and you let it run for 10 minutes or so, and that, that erases them. Okay, so great. So it's possible to get the EEPROM programmer and the EEPROM eraser inexpensively. So it's not like, you know, you don't want to pay 700 bucks or something if you're just going to make five cartridges. It's just not worth it. Um, OK, the PCBs. Um, someone else, Mark Blair, did a really nice website or a really nice project. This is the little PCB I got. This is courtesy of Mark Blair. Is Mark Blair here right now? Just any, you know, I kind of thought he might be. Um, so he has a website where he's got the uh, instructions on how to assemble the, the PCBs. And then he has a link to a fabricator called uh, OSH Park or Osh Park. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. You just, go to, you just go to their website and say, like, I want 10 of this pr particular project, and they will fabricate it for you and send it to you. And they, I think it cost about you know, like six or seven bucks per PCB, maybe more. I don't quite remember. But what they do is they have, like, bigger, they have like real jobs, like they're making big circuit boards. And what they do is they do little stuff like this in the space around the edge. Um, so it, your stuff may kind of arrive in dribs and drabs, or it may, you may have to wait uh, until they can fit your job into somebody else's job. Um, but hey, it works, right? Um, and they're really nice. Like the quality is really high. So that's how you get the, there you get the PCBs. Um, so once I got the PCBs, I was like, okay, good, I'm good to go. And then I realized, like, so the thing is only this big, and it happens to be the cartridge slot in the cocoa happens to be recessed about that much. So like, it, it's almost like you need salad tongs to get this thing into the machine. Like it's you're like, and then door on the cocoa too, like a little cartridge door, which does not make it easy. So 
This is one of those cases where you actually do need the box to put the, the little cartridge in. Because what it does is it just acts as an extender so you can easily get the cartridge PCB in and out of the machine. Um, so you really need these. And I was able to get some really nice ones from John Linville. And there's, there's John right there. So I, so I knew there was going to be somebody in the audience right, who's, who's involved in this project somehow. Because I got a lot of help. And I'm very grateful for that. Because um, every time I got to some place where like, I was like, oh, I need this, like somebody else either had it or told me where to get it. So, so these cartridge boxes are, were, were very nice. And he, he could probably tell you all about how we got them manufactured. But, but this was, the, uh, this was the, the solution to the, uh, I mean, it was either that or go to the dollar store and see how many salad tongs I could find. Um, OK. So then the next thing is you open up the software. This is the software for that EEPROM programmer. You select your, your, your program. And you see, actually, there's the letters DK right there. So that's the first two bytes of the cartridge or the header that say, this thing is a cartridge file. Please run it. And then it jumps right past it and starts, starts running the, the code. So you open up your file. And then you click like the, the P up here. You select what chip type you have. You click P. And then it fails in spectacular fashion over and over and over again. At least that was what happened with, with me. And why did that happen? I have absolutely no idea. I wish I could get up here and tell you why I had so many problems programming the chips. Um, the one that I had problems with was, it was a batch from AMD. They were refurbished. I don't know to what extent they were actually refurbished or just kind of found at the bottom of some dumpster somewhere. Um, however, remember that tutorial I told you about on eBay, or not eBay, YouTube, Dave Jones? In the tutorial, I went back. I was like, how did Dave Jones get this to work? Like, I mean, why am I having so many problems and he is not? I went back and watched the tutorial. He actually tried to program this exact part number and it failed. So the only thing I can think of is that there's just some incompatibility between this particular EEPROM programmer and that particular chip. Um, and then after... Um, I had tried several times to get this to work. Uh, I, my, uh, my colleague here, Scott Williamson, um, yes, he, Scott has done a project much more complicated than this. He wrote a version of Star Castle for the Atari 2600 uh, and sold a lot of them through Kickstarter. So, so I called it, I asked Scott for help. He brought in his EEPROM programmer. He couldn't program these chips either. So I don't know if this thing is actually like, it, it's like I'm just throwing chips in a toaster and I'm frying them and then handing them over to Scott to test and verify that they're, they're it's like, you know, let's just throw the priceless antiques in the incinerator and see if anything bad happens, right? It's sort of what it felt like we were doing. Um, however, I, I got ordered a batch of chips from a different manufacturer, and they all worked fine. So it's something about AMD. All I can say is just avoid AMD like the plague. Um, that, that's the, I, I still don't really know the source of the problem. Um, and then once the chip's program, you can just you take your little EEPROM chip, you program it, and then you just stick it on the PCB, you put it in the cartridge. And then at the end of this, you actually end up with one working cartridge or two working cartridges. Right? So at the point that I now have two working cartridges, this was like two days ago. So I was very happy to get like one or two working cartridges, because then I could actually do the talk that I told Jason I was going to do at the VCF like five months ago. I'm like, OK, yeah, remember that talk I said I was going to do? Yeah, I'm finally ready to do it, like five months later. So the time worked out perfectly. Um, so just to kind of go back over how the cartridge is different from the regular binary file, there's no header because you don't need one. Uh, you just have to tack on that little, the two bytes on the front, the D and the K, to say the cartridge file. You have to change the starting address, and then you have to split your variables um, from your code and initialize your RAM so that the variables um, get initialized. And then you have to remove any nice like quit function that you had, like go back to the operating system, right? Take it out because you can't, you can't return out of the operating system, or you can't return out of your program because you didn't jump into it, you branched into it. Um, and that, that's kind of, that was it. That was, that was how I managed to slog through this whole project over the course of about four months. I had a lot of help. Uh, Jim O'Keefe uh, sold me the Coco SD kit and um, provided some tech support when I had some issues getting it built. Uh, John Strong, who's part of the Coco community here, he did a really nice Minesweeper cartridge. Uh, he provided some advice for me. John Linville provided the cases. Scott provided the EEPROM assistance. So I'm not up here like saying, look, look at this brilliant thing I was able to do. Right? I had a lot of help doing it. But, but that's kind of the point, right? I mean, we're all, we all love this old technology. And it's nice to know that there's enough of this stuff out there that new people can come along and, and pick it up and, and experiment with it too. And it's, it's not like it's a closed system that the documentation has been lost. It's never going to be found. I mean, these things are still, um, 
they're alive and well and living, breathing things, and people are still making new stuff for it. That's, I don't know. I think that's what we all kind of want to happen with this technology, you know, as it gets older and older and older, and then there's less of it. So, so that, that was it. Um, I will take any questions, but I cannot promise to give you anything even remotely approaching an intelligent answer, because this was, like the ex this was beyond the extent of my knowledge. Uh, so anything? No, I'll just yield the, yes. Um, I came in as you were talking about how you sourced uh, your manufacturer for the PCBs. Yes. I wondering, did you brush on that again? I'm sorry to be that guy, but I was hoping maybe. Oh, the PCBs, okay. Um, there is a website out there, nf6x.net. Um, if you go to that website and just search on Coco, this page will come up. So this is not my page. This is his page. You know, he's showing you how to you know, prepare the boards and how to solder stuff on there and how to set the jumpers. And at the bottom of this page somewhere, there's a link that says, if you'd like to have this PCB manufactured, click on this link and then tell this company, OSH Park, how many of them you want. So what they do is they have these big batch jobs, and they work in the small batch jobs kind of in the margins around the other jobs. Uh, and then they'll show up in the mail, you know, in two weeks or something like that, you know, whenever they get around to it. But the, the quality seems like, seems very good. I mean, I've got, I've got one up here if you want to come take a look at it. So, yeah. Or actually, my table is like right outside, so um, if you guys, if anybody wants to pop by later and just take, take a look, I'll be happy to, to go through it all again. So, so that's, so, all right. well, that's it. So that's my talk. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. <laughs>